Today I'm going to review a new product that can replace that old, hot and loud, power hungry, spinning platter scuzzy hard drive in your vintage Max. The product I'm reviewing today is Mac SD from YMK Devices. YMK very kindly shipped me this free sample of the product and confirmed I do not need to return it back to them. Because I received it with the expectation of a review, I complied with YouTube's disclosure policies by checking the box that pertains to paid product placement. However, I was not compensated in any other way. I only received the one free sample. The content you're about to see was created entirely by me through numerous interviews with the developer, through the MacSD website information, also through extensive use of the product. The conclusions I reach at the end of the video are mine and mine alone. Now here's another disclosure. Until now, I've never used a product like this. <laughs> no, seriously. I just haven't had a strong incentive to buy one because I have a lot of spinning platter hard drives that still work fine. Another reason is because I have a product called the Floppy EMU, which is a floppy drive replacement product. It's slow, it's the same speed as the floppy drive, but uh, it's served me fairly well until now. Um, look, I understand that these flash drive products are, are fast, but um, sometimes you just use what works. But the upside of my inexperience with these products is that some of you may be in my shoes evaluating them for the very first time. But even if you're not, and you have plenty of SCSI to, to SD flash products in your arsenal, I still think my review can be useful to you because it illustrates very clearly what Mac SD has to offer. According to YMK Devices, the Mac SD was first conceptualized in late 2019, and the first product was sold in August 2020. Both the hardware and firmware are completely original works of YMK devices and are not derived from any other SCSI to SD product. In my own testing of the product, I found that Mac SD is certainly not a one-trick pony. Well, sure, it replaces your spinning platter hard drive with an SD card, but it's actually much more than that. It can basically uh, emulate an actual CD-ROM drive. And more than that, it, it's a CD changer. It even offers hardware level CD audio input and output, which is useful for Macs that support those features. Here's an overview of Mac SD's key features. It includes a bootable 16 gigabyte SD card with system 7.5.5 and more than 20 CD-ROM images. Most SD cards are compatible and the FAT32 format limits images to four gigabytes, but partitions greater than four gigabytes are supported. You're able to mount many VMAC and floppy EMU.DSK images as composites a feature unique to Mac SD. CD audio playback with Apple CD audio player is supported. The CD changer feature ejects the currently mounted CD image and auto loads the next. ISO, toast, and bin CD formats are supported. Firmware updates are done by SD card, so there's no need to connect to your computer by a USB cable. Configuration is done by INI text file on the SD card itself, no app required. A 3D printed mounting bracket is included. And you have three flexible options for SCSI termination, including active termination, pull down, and forced perfect. YMK's internal tests show compatibility with the SC and SC30, Classic and Classic 2, LC3, Centra 610, and PowerMac 6100. They also said Mac SD users have reported compatibility with the Quadra 700, Quadra 900, 2SI, LC, LC2, and 2FX. The 2FX in particular has various issues with SCSI drives. So the fact Mac SD has been confirmed to work on the 2FX implies it will work on most other 50-pin SCSI Macs as well. You also may need a long SCSI cable in some Macs because of the connector position on Mac SD. Mounting inside the LC500 series or Mac TV will be difficult without a SCSI extension cable. The Macintosh Plus is currently untested, but it will likely require that you add a diode at location CR1 for Mac SD to be powered properly. CR1 is also marked as termination power on the Mac Plus schematic. Here we can see the gray parts here, which are the 3D printed mounting bracket. It's a very nice addition because other SCSI SD products either don't include one or charge you extra for it. When used on a Classic or a Classic 2, the holes in the side of the bracket perfectly align with the slots in the stock sled. And on the SC30, you also use the same holes and these perfectly align with the cage hole screws. 
The bracket also fits other Macs which mount drives using bottom screws. Now here's Mac SD sitting on the SC30 bracket and you have some decisions to make on which orientation to mount it because of the ribbon cable. As we can see here the notch that goes into the motherboard is coming out this way. And so if you plug it in that way then that means if you have a short cable the notch would also plug in this way and you should put it in this orientation. If you have a long cable like mine, which has more than one connector on it, uh, you, you will have more leeway, uh, but still putting it in this orientation seems reasonable. However, you've got to keep in mind your cable is going to cover up the terminator and also the expansion area. So the problem is if you use the same type of easy to use connectors as I have, if you plug in the cable here, that is a short cable, it's going to tug and you're technically going to put too much tension on these and it's really not advised to do that so you would really need to have a longer cable so that you could plug it in and there's a big enough loop up here to where it's not going to push on these wires. Flipping the orientation seems to make more sense especially because you're going to have your LEDs over here and it doesn't make sense to have them covered up by the cable on this side. Uh, also, the SD card can be accessed even from under the cable fairly easily, but normally you'd want to access it from the back, I would think. And the problem is, is that you cannot do that with the short cable uh, because the notch would be on top. And even with the long cable, you are going to have to twist him around and then put him in there. It's not impossible to do that. But again, you'd need to have a long cable like this in order to do it. And here's how it looks with the cable twisted into place. So what about upgrades that use the TwinSpark TS adapter, like the Daystar Turbo 40, that mount over a hard drive like this, you ask? Well, as you can see here, even if I push down on it, it's just a couple millimeters too high. And it's not because of the LED connections either, it's just because of that ribbon connection instead of being on the back like a hard drive it's actually in the middle of the board so the ribbon cable sticks up too much for this card to fit on with the mac sd in that orientation so what happens if we mount him upside down well one good thing is my cable is no longer twisted and it lays down nice and flat too <laughs> but as you can see even though the sd card is still readily accessible leds are completely hidden all the jumpers are completely hidden maybe that's not important but it's a consideration. And ta-da, it fits. And with room to spare. The good news is that uh, if this card were ever to fall and touch the gray bracket, it's insulated, so it would never short out, which is something you can't say if it was just a regular hard drive in there. But as you can see, uh, these are the two audio connectors you don't use on the SC30, but still everything is upside down and it's a little bit less desirable to have it like this, but that can't be helped. If you've got an 040 accelerator, this is what you're going to have to do. SCSI devices will not function correctly without proper termination. MacSD's default termination setting is shown here. The dot next to the B is the location of pin 1, and that is nearest to the VCC printed on the circuit board. That is called pull up or active termination. Changing to the pull down configuration requires you to carefully pry out each resistor block and then flip it around so that pin 1 touches the ground side. Just like so. Remove both resistor packs to enable forced perfect or diode clamp termination. And by the way, it's not clear on which termination method is best, although MacSD's manual does make a good job of explaining it. When in doubt, remove both of the resistor packs like this and use forced perfect termination. I did encounter some strange problems when using MacSD on my SE30 along with a regular hard drive. YMK offered me three termination recommendations, the first being what you're seeing here, to put MacSD at the end of the SCSI chain in its pull-up configuration, which is active termination, and with the terminating resistors completely removed from the quantum hard drive. The second best option I was told is to remove these 330 ohm resistors and to put them in the correct orientation, of course, into the quantum hard drive. I was then advised that the third best option is to put MacSD's resistors into the pull-down configuration 
and then to put the quantum hard drives 110 ohm resistor packs back and that would allow the mac sd to be placed anywhere in the scuzzy chain and not just at the end of the chain i was then advised that if there is an external hard disk with its own active termination enabled connected to the same mac which has the quantum drive and the Mac SD installed, it would be best to put Mac SD in either forced perfect or pull down configurations to reduce the load on all SCSI devices. If you still have trouble, note that boot problems on the SE30 can often be resolved by merely changing the SCSI IDs. Here's another useful tip. You can boot directly from a specific ID by holding down Shift, Option, Apple, Delete, and then the number of the SCSI ID you want to boot from. And of course, you can also use the Startup Disk Control Panel or System Picker to choose your startup drive as well. The entire purpose of having Mac SD or any drive on your computer is to store and retrieve your data. Data is stored on the Mac SD in the form of an image of a hard disk, floppy disk, or CD-ROM. But not all images are the same though, and that can be confusing when an image doesn't work for some reason. Not everyone agrees, but I like two of the image naming terms used at savagetailor.com, which describes drive images and volume images. Drive images are an exact copy of a hard drive or CD. They contain a boot driver, a partition map, and one or more volumes, which hold your data. SCSI to SD products other than Mac SD handle only drive images, but neither the vintage Mac software emulator Mini VMAC, nor the popular floppy drive hardware emulator Floppy EMU work with drive images. Although there are Linux and macOS terminal commands that you can use to create and write data to drive images, that level of complexity is beyond the scope of this video. The good news though is that Mac SD includes a bootable drive image on the SD card. And if that's not enough, you can download more drive images from the Savage Taylor website. Keep in mind though that if you plan to use System 6, it can only see drives up to 2 gigabytes in size. A second type of image described at savagetailor.com is a volume image. Volume images are only one part of drive images. They hold your data, but do not have a boot driver. Personally, I would categorize raw floppy disk images with no headers or tags as volume images. Volume images can boot or mount inside Mini VMAC or Basilisk 2 only because the emulator provides the boot driver. The floppy EMU also handles volume images just fine because it provides its own driver. File names won't tell you the type of image you have, but if your image works in Mini VMAC or on a floppy EMU, it is a volume image. Unlike most other SCSI to SD products, Mac SD handles both drive and volume images without problem. It handles CD-ROM images too, such as ISO or BIN, uh, toast images as well, but toast images are basically just ISOs. Later on this video, I'll show you how to copy images over to Mac SD. Now that you understand the basic types of images, we can talk about a unique feature that's exclusive to Mac SD called composites. A composite is a drive image that's automatically created by Mac SD from one or more volume images that you put on the SD card and set up in the configuration file. The current firmware of Mac SD will not boot from a composite, but they're still very useful. For example, imagine a situation where you have 16 installer disks. If you did that from a floppy EMU or from actual floppy disks, it would take a very long time. But with Mac SD, because it's a fast SCSI drive, you just boot to the desktop and all of the images are there and you can finish your installation in no time. Unlike other SCSI to SD devices, Mac SD does not have a dedicated app that you need to use, nor does it require you to connect the product to your computer through USB cable. All of the setup is done through an INI text file that's saved to the SD card. We don't have time to go through all of the settings, but let's start by looking at how images are handled. Okay, so let's first look at the Mac SD's user manual. It uh, gives us five types, general, the drive image, set up a CD-ROM drive, composite image, which means it works with volume Im images, and then the actual disks used in whatever CD-ROM we set up. So these are the categories and they're all set off by brackets. So if we look at the actual INI file, at the very top we've got some notes, made notes by use of semicolon, 
you can see they're colored in purple here. Headings like general, the CD-ROM drive itself, and then we've got a drive image. And then down below, we have the individual disks that work in that CD-ROM drive. And so this is really the whole default INI file that comes shipped on the 16 gigabyte card that you get with Mac SD. Uh, so looking at the drives, um, again, this is just the CD-ROM drive. It's app emulating an Apple CD-ROM. And we see they have, it's starting with disk number 18 going through 100, and then it's got the first CD-ROM that we're going to see. But the boot drive is not a CD-ROM. That is going to be your uh, drive image. And that is named OS 755-500-megabyte.dsk on the 16 gigabyte card. It's very important that this file name matches what's on the 16 gigabyte card. For example, if you rename it, with an A at the end on the actual card itself, you're going to have to come into the I and I and rename it. If it's a little bit different, it's not going to work. And you'll note the number three is the SCSI ID, five is the SCSI ID. And what's missing here is a composite. So to add a composite, we basically uh, just pick a SCSI ID, like for example, two. And it has to be set up in this exact way with the brackets and the colon and everything. And then this image under bar directory equals has to be typed in exactly like that. And then you need to create a folder on the SD card and then name it. So we'll just call it SCSI2. And that needs to be the name of the folder. And then within this folder called SCSI2, you put your volume images, like from your floppy EMU or from your uh, mini VMAC uh, DSK files. Again, that you can't always tell what's a volume image or drive image based upon .dsk. In this case, it's .dsk, but it's actually a drive image. So uh, put your volume images in the folder. You can call it whatever you want. I just called it SCSI2. You could call it Poopy2, whatever you want to call it. You can call it that, so long as the folder name uh, matches this exactly. And then put all of your volume images. Could be floppy disk images or what have you. Put them all in that SCSI2 folder and that is going to be your composite disk that MacSD will automatically convert into a drive image and then mount all of the uh, individual disk images that you have in that folder. We keep in mind that you cannot use the same number SCSI ID more than once. Uh, also, spaces in file names are allowed. So even though you see underbars here, you could actually, uh, if the actual file name on your SD card is Apple space legacy space recovery, then yes, you could leave spaces in the file name that is allowed. It is recommended that you put quotes around such names, but uh, that's not absolutely necessary. And of course, MacSD lets us adjust the clock speed. The base speed here is 33 megahertz, so we can adjust that all the way up to 57 megahertz if we want. It's also important to note that Mac SD communicates with SD cards using an SPI interface, and the SPI speed is half of the system clock speed. In some cases, there could be SD cards that are too slow to work at this higher overclocked 57 megahertz, but so far we've not, the developer and myself have not come across any cards that are like that, but that is the one caveat to overclocking. It could be that there maybe is a SD card that you have in your collection that just won't work. So you'll have to use the lower default 33 megahertz speed instead. And then going back to the manual again, it says in the general section, uh, in the general section attributes here, the LED intensity can be individually set for the internal or onboard LEDs as well as your external LEDs, assuming you add an RGB LED or something like that uh, to the expansion header pins, you would just go back to your INI file and then adjust your intensity, say if you want it to be 90%, then the internal LED intensity will be that. And then you can set your external intensity to be 100 if you want. And the manual says that the default values are 50. So that's just a basic overview of the INI file. For more information, uh, just be sure to read through the MacSD manual. 
When you boot your vintage Mac with Mac SD, you of course can copy files to it, read files, create files, all you like, and you don't have to worry that files on the SD card are going to be fragmented. However, when you take out the SD card and then put that in a modern computer and start deleting files and adding files, that's when the files can become fragmented. That is due to the FAT32 format on the card itself, and it can even happen to a floppy EMU because it uses the same format. The good news though is that MacSD can automatically re-index those files and it will even light an LED to show you that procedure is going on. However, re-indexing can take a long time. So just to clarify, repeated saves of the INI text file will not cause fragmentation. Individually copying new files to the SD card will not cause fragmentation. It's recommended to not save the INI file while other files are being copied to the SD card to avoid fragmentation. Deleting and then adding files can cause fragmentation, and dragging and dropping multiple files to the SD card can sometimes cause fragmentation. So to avoid fragmentation, it's best to just leave old files you don't use anymore uh, on the SD card until it fills up. And when it does fill up, you put the SD card in your modern computer, you back it up, you reformat it as FAT32 MBR, then you restore all the files. The stock SD card, it's plenty fast when you're using it as a boot drive on a vintage computer. But when it comes time to putting it in a modern computer and copying gig many gigabytes of files to and from it, uh, in my experience, it's just painfully slow. This card is not fast at all. So if you're going to do a lot of copying like that with a modern computer, I would strongly advise getting your own SD card. Uh, for example, I have a very fast V60 Sony Tough card See the text description below because I actually review this card. Um, you can even get faster cards than this, but it gets pretty expensive when you do that. But a V60 card, boy, uh, you can copy files to and from this card with a modern computer if you have a fast UHS-2 reader, many times faster than you can with the stock Mac SD SD card. Sometimes new firmware will come out, which adds features, fixes bugs, and otherwise makes MacSD a better product. As mentioned in the MacSD user manual, you must have an appropriately formatted SD card, and then download the firmware file and copy it to the SD card, then insert the SD card into MacSD, attach the BL jumper, and finally, power on your Mac. When I first started testing MacSD, I thought I was doing everything right, but I just couldn't update the firmware. I continued to get the repeating error LED. YMK then informed me that it's the SD card's format that was the culprit. Not only does it have to be formatted as FAT32 MBR, but you also have to have the partition type set to 0x0c, which is also known as MBR type 12. Most Mac users like me will use Apple's disk utility on a modern Mac to format SD cards. But when you do that, the FAT32 partition type is 0x0b, or MBR part 11, which currently is not allowed for Mac SD firmware updates. There are various ways to format the SD card as FAT32 MBR 0x0c, but they're rather complicated and time consuming, so I'm not gonna cover that in this video. By the way, if you're wondering about normal usage, you don't have to worry about this problem. What I'm talking about now only applies to firmware updates, so you can just skip this section if you're just wanting to copy images over and use it normally. The good news though is that YMK, during the course of making this video, uh, very kindly updated the firmware to make it a little bit easier uh, to resolve the problem. The only caveat is that you're going to need to have a 0x0c formatted card in order to apply the 0.10.2 firmware update uh, that, that makes the situation easier. But if you don't already have a Mac SD, then if you buy one new, it will most likely have the most recent firmware version. Uh, it's not restricted to 0.10.2. Any firmware that is that version or newer will apply. And the steps that I'm going to show you now are going to be how Mac SD will automatically convert your 0x0b format to 0x0c. First, power off. Next, remove the BL jumper. Insert the SD card that you freshly formatted in Disk Utility. 
with or without the firmware file on it, power on your Mac, you will see the error LED flash if there are no bootable volumes on it. Don't worry because Mac SD has now converted your SD card format to 0x0C. Power off your Mac. If the new firmware file is already on your SD card, then just install the BL jumper. Then power on your Mac. And this writes firmware to the Mac SD. Also note that you are allowed to write the same firmware version as the firmware version that's already in there. And when the SD lamp stops flashing, and you see the SCSI lamp flash slowly, that means the firmware update is done. Note that if you insert a 0x0B formatted SD card with the BL jumper in place and then power on, Mac SD will not convert the format to 0x0C. You must have the BL jumper removed, then power on to allow Mac SD to fix the SD card's format, then power off and put the BL jumper back on, then power on again to write firmware to the Mac SD. The Mac SD expansion port allows you to add your own single color or common cathode RGB LED to more conveniently see what's going on with a Mac SD. RGB LEDs are great because they give you the equivalent of three LEDs on the Mac SD. I purchased this pack of common cathode RGB LEDs and a pack of these wires on Amazon to make this. As we can see, I have the LED with its wires already attached, a little heat shrink around them, and I even have it in the mounting bracket here. You can see this round black part. This is part of the original plastic that came with the stock LED. I'm not going to go into this video on how to properly install it, but suffice it to say, if you don't have this, or if you've lost it, you can still secure the LED into this bracket with some hot glue. Uh, you can also see that I have the four wires connected. Uh, what I did is, I'm not going to show it in this video, but basically I took a resistor. You can take 330 ohms, 500 ohms, 1000 ohms. The higher the resistance, the, the dimmer it will be. But basically you can take that to uh, a 5 volt power supply, even a 12 volt power supply, so you don't burn out the LED. And then you can determine which color is which. But basically the black or the ground uh, is right here. And then I soldered a red wire, which leads to the red lamp of this LED, the green wire corresponds to the green lamp, and the blue wire corresponds to the blue lamp. Now we can connect our LED wires on the expansion port. I want to connect the red LED to be error, and that is one, two, three, four, five, six over. And then I want to make my blue LED to indicate fragmentation, and that is going to be one to the left of red, so we've got error and then fragmentation. And then directly behind the blue, I'm going to make green to be the SD card access. And then I'm going to connect the ground. And here's what the SD indicator LED looks like. It's set to 90% intensity. And here's what the red error LED looks like. It also is set to 90% intensity. and the blue LED lights when there's fragmentation on the card. If you have a Mac Classic which doesn't have a drive access LED on front, YMK shows how to put the LED and the SD card slot on the back. Their mod even shows how to install a push button switch for firmware updates, giving you convenient access to the most useful features without ever opening the case. Here is the contents of the 16 gigabyte SD card that ships with Mac SD. We can see that there's the OS 7.5.5 500 megabyte uh, boot disk here. And we also see that most of these files are ISOs. Um, we also see some toast files. Toast are just uh, same as ISO, .cdr, all of those file name extensions. You can change them and they all work the same. They're just a CD image there. And then we have the INI file. We can see it's largely stock, but I've, I modified it a little bit to change the intensity of the LEDs so that they're brighter. This, these are my external LEDs. Boosted it to 57 megahertz instead of the standard 33. And I also added a SCSI ID6 composite image here, which links to the SCSI SCSI 6 directory, which is right here. 
Currently it is empty because I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I downloaded all the, these files from Macintosh Garden and if we do a quick look on it we can see okay there's a dot disk image that's a volume image and on here the same thing it's got two volume images and then the hypercard it's a sit file it contains a dot img so I'm going to select all of these and then go ahead and decompress them and then we can see here uh, this hypercard image yes we know it's legacy is something we can just drag right over and then we won't drag the folders over we only want the the disk images so we can see on here it's got two disk images so I'll drag those over and then uh, the last folder here has one disk image so I'll drag that over so this will be four disks inside of our composite Okay, and here we are at the desktop. We can see the primary drive is up here. Then we have the CD changer here. And then we have, well, three out of the four. So we only have the Crystal Quest images and not the HyperCard image. That implies that the HyperCard image has an issue on it that is incompatible uh, with Mac SD but there is a fix for that. All right, here's our problematic file that I downloaded from Macintosh Garden. And I'm going to solve it with mini vmac command O to open here. And we can see that it mounts just fine. Sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll see a file, a volume image that works in mini vmac and you'll think it's going to work on your floppy EMU or Mac SD, but in fact it won't. There are technical reasons why, but uh, we're going, I'm going to show you how to solve the problem here. Now, if you use disk copy, it won't work. The solution that I found, the easiest solution in my opinion, is to go over to the mini vmac blanks and download this zip file here. And that's what you see here, all of these blanks. And in mini vmac, we see that this has about 45 megabytes in the disk. So I want to have something bigger than that. I'm going to choose this. 56 megabytes, I'm going to duplicate it, then I'm going to double click to decompress that, and then I'm going to type hypercard-241, we'll call it dot disk, and then I'm going to mount that here. I'm also going to call it hypercard-241, and I'm going to open it up and show you that it has 55 megabytes available. So I'm going to select all and copy over. Yeah, and it's really that simple. So now I can just go over here and here's my disk image fully populated. Just to prove it to you, I'll open it up again. You can see all the files are on it, right? And then I'm going to just drag this over here and copy it. And actually, I've already done that. And here it is. And one, one other test I wanted to do at the same time is on my floppy EMU, I have this HD20 disk, which uh, contains, it's like a couple hundred megabytes in size. It contains System 6. So I want to prove to you that not only will these three Crystal Quest images mount again, but this time we're going to be able to mount these as well. And here we are booted to the desktop once again. We can see that we now have two more additions to the family in addition to the crystal quest we have hypercard and the system 6.08 and if i double click it we can see all the files are there and my system 6.08 is right here as well and all the files on it so that is how you create a composite disk and occasionally there will be an image issue I actually mentioned this to YMK and uh, I was told by the engineer who created it that he is working on a possible solution so that you don't have to do the manual labor to fix the disk. Whether that's going to be out by the time I make this video or not, I don't know, but uh, I'll mention that in the comments if something changes or you can check the Mac SD website. But for now, I just want to show you some, some of the basics. The CD changer, uh, the basic CD is legacy recovery. That's the first one that you will see here. And on that, 
you will find basically every <laughs> Mac OS version that you could possibly want to install. Uh, and it includes the system updates as well. So you probably saw system 7.5 there, uh, but it also includes the 7.5.5 update. And then for an SE30, if you have a ROM that is non-stock, you could also run 7.6 and even OS 8 as well. So very handy. Now how the CD changer works is this. All you have to do is drag it to the trash. And then when you drag it to the trash, sometimes it takes two, okay, then the next CD is automatically loaded. The Lost Continent. And then we drag this one to the trash and the seventh guest loads. And we drag this one to the trash and Rebel Assault is the next one. And I could keep going, but there are more than 20, so it would take a long time. But basically you get the picture. All you have to do is just drag them to the trash and the next one automatically loads. So uh, you're not gonna have more than 20 CD images that load at once. Only one CD loads at a time and uh, it just switches amongst them. Now I did some modifications on the files that that the files that come here uh, with it, the system folders are minimal due to copyright issues, but I just absolutely hate that because uh, you don't get the control panels that you do with a full install. So what I did is I did the full install, which allows me to have the fundamentals, of what you're saying here. I booted from system 7.1, so the speed, you could see that. Mouse, if you do a minimal install, you don't even get the mouse control panel. And you know, if you take out the battery and reboot, then your mouse, you're, you're moving it like crazy, but it just goes only a little bit. So I did a full install of 7.1, 7.5.5, and 6.08, and I recommend that you do that as well. But even if you don't, you can boot off of the Mac SD, uh, SD card just fine because it has all that you really need uh, to do a basic booting. And like I said, the very first CD includes all of the installers that you need to install the OS of your choice. And then of course, you've got the System Picker app, which will allow you to choose which system folder to boot from. And so that's the basic operation. Some good news for those of you who have a non-stock ROM, such as a 2SI, 2FX, or Rominator 2, the Mac SD is fully compatible. The only caveat is that the minimal system 7.5.5 on the stock 16 gigabyte SD card will not boot with a non-stock ROM because the system file does not have the required hack. So you either need to hack the system file or my recommended approach is to install the full system 7.5.5 and then do the hack or you can just install system 7.1 or the full install of system 6, which will boot just fine. Alternatively, you can also install 7.6.1 or OS 8.1. And you can see I successfully booted into system 7.6.1, which is not possible with a stock SE30 ROM. This is my performance testing setup. For the base computer, I'll be using a Macintosh SE30 testing three different drives. The drive contained inside this external enclosure is an IBM DGHS 4.4 gigabyte SCSI drive, which is quite fast. I will then be testing a Quantum LPS 540S, which is just your standard SCSI drive, and then of course the Mac SD, but I will not only be using the standard 16 gigabyte included SD card, but also a very fast Sony Tough V60 card which I normally use in my Panasonic GH5 camera. And I will put a link in the text description below because I did a video review of this card. It is quite fast. The SE30 has a 68030 processor running at 16 megahertz, and I will of course be testing it in this stock condition, but I've also prepared two different accelerators. The first is a Micromac Demo 68030 running at 50 megahertz, same processor, just higher clock speed. And to close out the testing, I will be using a Daystar Turbo 40 running at 40 megahertz, which will be useful for those of you who uh, would like to get a general idea of how fast Mac SD might be in your Quadra 650, Quadra 700, or Quadra 840 AV. Currently I'm booted into System 7.1. Uh, all of the control panels and extensions that are relevant to the accelerators will be loaded at the time that I have that uh, accelerator installed. 
And you can see that the test suite I'm going to use is Mac Bench, which is really one of the more uh, detailed test benchmarking apps available. Each test takes almost two hours. It's really quite extensive, and that's doing the disk testing only. The reason I'm using version 3 is because this is the newest version of Mac Bench that will run on my SE30, not only for reasons of CPU, but also for screen resolution. This particular SE30 has 32 megabytes of RAM, and I'm using the stock ROM. You can see in the test section, uh, there's a variety of tests you can, you can use, but I'm going to choose all disk tests. And before I start this running, I want to say that Mac SD does not use data caching, which means that every read and every write goes directly to the SD card. And that's why the performance of the SD card really matters. Okay, and here are the benchmarks results for MacBench 3. I'm running this in the Basilisk 2 emulator because I want to be able to show you the beautiful colored uh, uh, bars here. By the way, if you hear any road noise while I'm explaining this, I'm sorry, but I just have to get this video out and doing this at home with all the noisy cars is... I have no choice, so uh, please bear with me. Uh, but basically, we can see I have a reference system in... I did not run this test. This is the reference system that comes built in with Mac Bench 3. It's a Power Mac 6160. I, you know, it's a SCSI drive, but I just don't know if that's really running PowerPC native code or if it's emulated 68K, but nevertheless, that's their base system. That's 100%. And then uh, at the very bottom here, I've got also another stock file, the Quadra 630. I did not run this test. This came with Mac Bench 3. This has an IDE disk, and from what I understand, it's the first Mac that had IDE, whereas most Macs have SCSI. And so we can see here that all of the tests that I'm showing you here, I'm going to show you the accelerated SE30 in a bit, but right now we have the stock SE30 running my quantum hard drive, and you can see it's a little bit faster than the power PC machine, and then the DGHS is faster still. It's a fast SCSI hard drive. And then we have four tests which show the Mac SD running at its, uh, two of them running at its stock 33 megahertz speed with the stock 16 gigabyte card. And uh, that's actually doing quite well even with the stock card. But then I have my Sony Tough 128 gigabyte V60 card, which really screams. And then we overclock it to 57 megahertz each for the stock card and the Sony card. And you can see it's not a substantial increase for my 16 megahertz stock processor, but I'm going to show you the accelerated results in a few moments. Uh, the Quadra 630 here is doing quite well. It's 159%, but still, uh, most of the scores with Mac SD beat out even that. And then we have the publishing mix down here, which is doing Photoshop, Quark Express on large files. And based upon the way those tests are run, uh, the Power Mac comes out ahead. Uh, and then so does the Quadra 630. Uh, the DGHS, remember, is a just a regular spinning platter hard drive. So the, the configuration that comes the closest is overclocked with a V60 fast SD card, and it gets roughly 82% of the Power Mac under the heavy-duty testing. And please keep in mind that this is an SE30, so its SCSI is limited in speed. And so you're going to get faster SCSI with the Quadra faster SCSI with 6100. If you have a A40AV, if you have a Quadra 700, Quadra 650, you're going to have faster SCSI still. So your bars are should be, in theory anyway, higher than these because you have faster SCSI. And by the way, I have all of these tests as individual files put on a disk image that's zip compressed in the text description below. And I, I, don't, I don't have time in this video to show you every test, but if you, if you expand out disk mix, you can see that it has uh, sequential read 512, and uh, then you can scroll down and you can see sequential read 32K, 1K, sequential reads, and then uh, it keeps going and going, and then you'll have your random reads. And this is why it takes almost two hours to complete these tests, because, uh, you know, th there's, there's really a lot of tests that it has to go through. But uh, basically, you can download my files and see all those for yourself. And now I'm going to show you the accelerated tests. And here we are with accelerators. I've got a 50 megahertz demo 68030 in all of these SE30 tests here. So again, with the Power Mac as the base and then Quadra 630 rounding it out at the bottom, we can see that um, it does extremely well. My goodness, almost four times faster than the Power Mac 6100 score 
if we overclock to 57 megahertz and use a fast V60 SD card. I mean, look how much faster the fast SD card is compared to the stock SD card. That That's substantial, folks. Uh, so with a stock SD30 running at 16 megahertz, the processor's influence isn't really seen. But with a faster processor, boy, it really makes a, a, a very serious difference here. And uh, if we look down at the publishing disk mix, we can see that, well, the fastest configuration here, 94%, it's closing in on the same speed as the Power Mac 6100, so that's not bad. So let's look at a Turbo 40, which is the fastest configuration my SC30 can run. And here it is, uh, SC30 with 40 megahertz, 68040, Daystar Turbo 40. I also added a 48 megahertz configuration to this test, so accelerated just above 33. And, well, have a look. Uh, the SE30 with its quantum drive matches the Quadra 630. Exactly, 159%. And then we have our baseline base clock speed Mac SD, 16 gigabyte, getting about three times of what the 6100 is. But take a look at this, our best configuration with a fast V60 card. We've got 57 megahertz overclock, 443%, so 4.43 times faster than the Power Mac. And of course, it blows the Quadra 630 out of the water as well. And then we can see here we're getting 89%. So still, e even with these, this best case configuration, it's still not quite as fast as the other two. But I think that SCSI throughput really has a lot to do with this in this particular test when you have these huge, huge files. So be sure to keep that in mind if you are running a machine that's much faster than an SE30 with faster SCSI, uh, you should be able to see greater performance than this. I also ran benchmarking with SCSI Director Pro because I saw some people online using it. I just did screen captures uh, of that and you can see that's also in the zip file that I include for you down below that you can see that. This is with my quantum drive and you can see the graph uh, for reads and writes. And again, I did this on my SC30, so that's why everything is in black and white. But if we go to the Turbo 40 Mac SD, 57 megahertz overclock, we can see how it performs there. Um, this, again, is just raw, quick tests. I think it did what's called a butterfly and, and some other tests we can see up here. But um, uh, the benchmarks on this particular test don't look quite as impressive, but I'm going to give greater priority to the Mac bench scores because, again, each, t each and every one of those tests took almost two hours versus this, which just took a matter of seconds to run. I'm now going to run a series of boot time tests with System 7.1 using Mac SD and my two regular hard drives. I'm going to overclock the Mac SD to 57 megahertz use the two SD cards that I used in my other benchmarks. And I'm going to start the stopwatch when the Welcome to Macintosh screen first appears. and stopping the stopwatch when it reaches the desktop, which in this case is about 22, almost 23 seconds. Despite the word Mac being in the product name, YMK told me that they are soon to release support for Windows 98 and Windows XP in their forthcoming 0.11.0 firmware update, which will also include another enhancement uh, that will be a CD eject button. Speaking of which, if you boot into System 7 with your Mac SD and have PC Exchange installed, you can take advantage of Windows FAT32 formatted disk images by making them composites. MacSD is sold on Tendi and retails for $119 US dollars. 
That price includes the 16 gigabyte SD card and mounting bracket, and you can choose the shape of the CD audio input and output jacks that you prefer. Shipping is free within the United States, and very reasonable outside the US. I also googled up some prices on other SCSI Test D products, including the SCSI Test D version 5.2, which sells for $66.75 US. Shipping is extra, and that includes a 16 gigabyte SD card, but no mounting bracket. Next is the SCSI to SD version 6 2021 model, which sells for 117 US dollars and 75 cents, when you add the optional 16 gigabyte SD card and optional bracket. Shipping is extra. Then we have RASCSI, which is based upon a Raspberry Pi computer. The basic unit costs $30, shipping is extra, but then you need to buy the Raspberry Pi for an additional $35 and additional shipping. Assuming you go for a Raspberry Pi 4 with 2 gigabytes of RAM. And then at the low end of the pricing spectrum, we have Blue Scuzzy. The UK seller shows 46 British pounds, which is roughly 63 US dollars. That's unassembled. It includes shipping to Australia and Asia. I mention that because I'm based in Asia. Then we have 68 British pounds or 94 US dollars for the assembled product, and that also includes shipping to Australia and Asia. And then if you're based in the United States, the cost is $25 plus shipping for the unassembled product or $50 plus shipping for the assembled product. I should add that buying something based on price alone really does overlook product feature differences. So I think it's important to consider uh, the composites feature, CD changer, CD audio features, and overclocking of Mac SD before making a final decision on what to buy. Well, here are my final conclusions on Mac SD. First, the negatives. Changing the SD card data on a modern computer can cause fragmentation. But of course, proper usage can avoid this. Editing a text file to change settings can be troublesome for people who make typos. Price is at the high end compared to other SCSI to SD products. You can break the resistor blocks during normal removal if you aren't careful and if you swap them out very often. Firmware updates can be fiddly if your SD card's format is the wrong type. Mac SD is configured for use as an internal drive only. And here are the positives. It includes a useful mounting bracket and bootable SD card. It's quite speedy even with the included SD card, but it really screams with a fast SD card. Overclocking worked fine with all my SD cards and is a real performance enhancer. The composite image feature is very nice if you work with mini VMAC or floppy EMU images a lot. The asking price can be justified if you benefit from its unique features like composites or the CD-ROM changer. Being able to use an RGB LED and fine-tune the brightness is very cool. YMK Devices was very cooperative, friendly, and even modified the firmware when I found issues. This proves there's ongoing support after you buy the product. The added benefits of silent, cool, and low power operation make Mac SD all around better than a spinning hard drive. Overall, I think Mac SD is a very compelling product. Even if you have other SCSI to SD devices, assuming you have a lot of vintage Macs, then buying a Mac SD is worthwhile just to see how it compares. But if you're just evaluating these products for the very first time, I hope that my video today has given you the amount of information you need to make an informed buying decision. And I have some good news for you. I approached YMK and asked them if they would be willing to offer a discount for viewers of my channel, and they agreed. All you have to do to get a limited time 5% discount is enter the code 347949FE on the Tendi checkout page. And there's one more thing. I also approached YMK and I said, well, what about those people who have multiple vintage Macs, they maybe want to buy more than one Mac SD, can you help them out too? And YMK agreed. To do that, all you have to do is click on the contact button on the Tendi checkout page and simply ask them for a volume discount based upon the number of units that you expect to buy. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more content like this in the future, please subscribe and then click the bell icon to get notifications when I come out with new videos. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments section below. Thank you for watching folks and have a great day.